So I was given a lot of leeway in what I wanted to talk about. And there are probably three or four topics that I'm really good at, women's leadership, um, seeking out a mentor. But the one that I chose today was the one that absolutely has been part of my life since I was a small, very, very young child, and that's networking. So I'll start the story in 1963, um, and one of my mom's closest friends is in the audience. But my mom arrived in this country the wife of a graduate student at Northwestern, and she knew no one except my father. She had no family in this country, she had no friends, and she set out to create a happy life. And I think the incredible transition between Katie's talk and mine is you control how you use your time and energy, and your future is 100% within your own control. I believe it. There'll be you know, financial circumstances, there'll be other circumstances, but you control how you use your time and your energy. So what did my mom do? My mom met people at the YWCA because it was free. Um, she had very limited resources. My dad used to give her her allowance every Friday, which in 2015 seems very you know, old school and ridiculous, but I think if we talk to a lot of our mothers or grandmothers, that was the old way. And she set out to meet someone new almost every week. And so at the end of this talk, I'm hoping to get you, every single person in this room, to be able to reach out to someone at least once a month that you don't exactly know on the level that you want to get to know them. So that's really my end game. And what is networking? To me, networking is finding common ground with someone, getting to know someone at a deeper level, and understanding what you can do to help them meet other people. The end game isn't to get a job, though I've spoken about that, and maybe at the end we'll touch on that. The end game isn't to get something from them. However, if you do have another agenda, I suggest you be upfront about it. Um, if you're trying to get money for a board you're on, if you're trying to get them to join a board you're on, you do want to be upfront about that type of networking. But I'm talking about the joy of simply connecting with people and understanding who they are. Why would you do this? Um, isn't it much easier to just go to the Starbucks or read a book, sit alone, um, maybe go to yoga class where you don't have to talk to anyone? I think it's, there are a lot of my friends and people I know well in this audience. I hate yoga because you can't talk to anyone. So it makes me crazy and I've stopped going. And I'm well known at the community house. Um, I happen to be lucky enough to serve as president of the community house women's board here, but to talking to basically every woman down in the gym who will talk to me. Um, I have a tendency to focus on women. I always um, have because I find that women um, are willing to find ways to connect through their children, through their faith-based organizations, through boards that they serve on to help other people. One of the things that I ask my kids, and I have, I didn't learn it myself. They probably learned it at Skokie School in that REACH program. It was, what have you done for someone else besides yourself and your family this week? And I still try to ask my kids that. Um, I have a, a junior in college, a child who's going to college next year, and an 11-year-old. And it's a theme in our family. It's who have you really reached out to? So I'm trying in my own family to do all the things that I'm talking to you um, about. Um, so how many people, I'm just doing a quick survey, have done what they believe is networking sometime in the last month? Okay, so this is a very, very engaged audience. About 70% is the read that I'm getting on this. Um, there's two common mis misconceptions around networking. Number one, as I told you, that you want something. And number two, that it'll always be successful. There are going to be bad networking meetings. Unfortunately, I wish it wasn't true. There are people who will not return your email or phone call. Um, what I suggest to do, how to do it, is set personal standards for responsiveness. It doesn't have to be by the end of the day. People have a lot of commitments. Maybe it's 48 hours. Maybe it's by the Friday of that week. I suggest that you just try to implement a personal responsiveness standard and communicate that to people. I work full time, 
I am sometimes not able to return phone calls by the end of the day, and I probably spent 20 years of my professional life returning every single phone call, personal and professional, before 9 p.m. when I go to bed. I can't do that. I tell people I'll return your phone call within 24 hours, and I stick to that. And there are people who've tested me on this. I will return your phone call or email <laughs> to anyone who you send me if I know you within that time frame. Um, so I suggest that you just do that and you communicate that to people. The other thing that I suggest, and this is just a very basic thing, is have a personal business card that has your mobile number, that has your email. Many of us were engaged in professional careers early in our life. We had something that was our calling card that made it easy to connect. You gave it to someone. They knew how to get a hold of you. What I'm saying is, is that you can do that in your personal life as well. You know, there, and this is very inexpensive. It's very easy. You can get high quality ones, medium. How many people in this room have a personal business card? OK, less than 10%. It's a very easy way to help make networking easy. Um, my husband and I happen to go to a lot of events for our personal life, for philanthropic things. I like meeting new people. I think I'm sitting at a you know, black tie party. Oh, this person seems very interesting, very easy. I hand them a card, and hopefully we'll connect at some point. Either I'll reach out to them, or they'll reach out um, to me. How many people in this audience are on LinkedIn? OK, about 70 60%. LinkedIn has, over the last 36 months, become the single greatest networking tool for professionals, both for individuals who are being sought out as well as reconnecting with people who you may have known professionally or personally. I would say about 30% of my LinkedIn contacts are people who I know through my personal life. And so it makes it a lot easier to connect people through that tool rather than creating an email to connect two people. So I would do recommend, I will tell you that my 83-year-old father hates LinkedIn, and it makes him crazy. He's still professionally engaged, and makes him crazy when people send him LinkedIn invitations. I've actually thought about creating a LinkedIn profile for him so that he can just accept uh, them. How many people here like LinkedIn? OK, so a lot fewer than the who participate. OK. Um, so we talked about um, responsibility um, of responsiveness and sincerity. What I want to focus on is how you can cross your professional endeavors, your personal endeavors, people who you just know, and philanthropic endeavors. And what makes the three work together? I have a tendency to be selected to serve on the nominating co committee or the membership committee of boards that I serve on because I like the idea of bringing people who I know into an organization that I'm passionate about. But even if you're using all of your networking just to create a happier place to live, I arrived in Winnetka exactly 18 years ago and I knew two people. One of my former bosses and our real estate agent, and that was it. Um, and the person who came the first day with the moving van on our driveway um, our neighbor, Ann Healy, two doors down, she and her husband walked down and said, welcome to Tower Road. And those words with a three-month-old in you know, her car seat while the movers are going back and forth, a three-year-old and a knowing no one were so powerful for me because it made me feel welcome. And even though it may be irritating to people on our block on Tower from Gordon Terrace to Hibbard, I'm going to welcome every single person that moves in with a small modest plant and a small note with my business card in it that says, welcome to Tower Road. Because it may, and, and most people will respond, oh, you know, nice to meet you. There are going to be people who just don't respond. They're full. Their, their plates are full. Maybe they're stuck. Um, but it makes me feel good that we've created a community. Um, and it's not important who it was, but there was a little boy on our street who was maybe four or five. I came out of my house one day, and he was sitting on our old front steps. And I thought, uh, you're probably not old enough to be left alone. What are, you know, what are you doing here? What's going on? And he said, 
I ran away from home. I thought, oh, this is bad. Luckily, you only ran two doors down, or three. And, and, he sa and I said, what made you come here? And he said, because you're always smiling when you walk past my house. And it brought tears to my eyes that this little boy, clearly he'd gotten a fight with one of his siblings, um, just wanted a place where, and that's what we all want. We want a place where we feel welcome um, and that someone will take the time to speak to us. Um, the other story that I will tell you about Winnetka, and it's one of the things that I love about this community, is that people are willing to find a community organization, and there are so many here to choose from. Um, I go to the last blast of summer here at the community house where all the community organizations have um, a, you know, a table where they talk about their organization. On the community house board, we have a woman who said, I arrived here in winter. It was freezing, and then it snowed for three and a half months, and I had a two-year-old. And I know no one, and I read about the Community House Women's Board like on a piece of paper, and I called and said, can I be considered? Of course, we welcomed her with open arms, but I'm saying that that's the kind of community this is. I bet there are 20 people who I know in this audience who if someone called them and said, I want to get involved, we would connect them to some other organization or one that we're involved in. The other part of philanthropy that I want to talk about is about helping people and this concept of getting unstuck or moving forward. I was involved with Family Service of Winnetka Northfield, um, which is a sliding scale um, organization. So the cost that you bear is the cost that you can afford. And it helps people deal with issues that might be really hard to talk about in pe with people you know, maybe challenging issues marital problems, children with, had, that have issues that you can't solve yourself, mm -hmm. depression, um, loss of a family member. And I wrote a, um, an article in the newsletter a couple of years ago um, that talked about being um, nosy in a friendly way. If you haven't seen someone that you know you regularly see, maybe every day at the gym, maybe regularly at the Starbucks, now that our Panera is gone, sadly, um, what do you do when you just haven't seen them? Reach out to that person. They might be going out through something that you just don't know about. I have a family member that suffers from depression that went um, really unrecognized for about 10 years. And the ability to be free and understand that maybe a mental illness isn't something that's to be ashamed of I think that every single one of us can be helpful in helping someone get unstuck and move. Um, so it's the, the crossroads of networking and helping someone. So that's really all I had for you today, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you.